kids. Hi, Good. Andy. How are you? Kids. All right. Hey, Blastmore saying tight. We have Nicole Corey here, and she's our guest, and we're about to start the show now. Um, hey, Blasphemers, welcome to Simple Blasphemy, where we have the best times with the worst topics. We're three friends that discuss everything and nothing, from wacky headlines to games and trivia. All subjects bizarre and risque are on the table. Our weekly guests range from friends, musicians, and artists to professionals in a variety of industries. Mm -hmm. We go live on Facebook and YouTube every Tuesday night at 9 p.m. Eastern. Want to support the show? Join our Patreon. You can find it and more at www.simpleblasphemy.com. So grab a drink and join in! It's too late now. This is Simple Blasphemy. <laughs> All right, welcome to the Simple Blasphemy Podcast, all you blasphemers out there. My name is Zach Ward, and I have here with me always Andrew. Oh my goodness, we're getting formal. I'm not into that whole brevity thing, but I love you too, Zach Ward. I love you a lot. And also, Mr. Zach Green, the cleaning machine. Yep. You're on vacation. Yeah, I, get to, I get to see I both greens today, too. Interesting. All the info on the show can be found at simplebestme.com. And if you click that like, share, subscribe button, this week you'll receive five years of what, Andy? Unlimited yellow legal pads. Whoa, I love nice. these. I love these fucking things. And I okay. use like two or three of them a month. So unlimited okay. yellow legal pads. All right. Any specific brand, meat, or uh, any? Let's take yeah. a look. Hang on. Remember, please like, share, and subscribe all at once, like control alt delete, and you get five years of legal pads. Uh, pen pen gear. Pen gear. All right. Fine. Are they strong enough to build shelter out of? Do you want to find out? I know I might need okay. to soon. And okay. as mentioned this week, our special guest is none other than Nicole Corey. How are you, Nicole? I'm fantastic, Zach. How are yeah. you? Zach and hey. Zach and Andy. And E, yeah. We, and we, e. we encompass the entire alphabet, sometimes twice at the end. That. Awesome. And I'm right sure. in the middle, so it works out yeah. perfect. Oh! And for all you guys tuning in, we're going to, um, Nicole has a whole bunch of different shoes that she <laughs> fills, so to speak. And we're going to dive into some of them. And if, you, if you're new to the show, you're more than welcome to ask questions in the chat, whether it be Facebook, Twitch, and or YouTube. Um, Join in. I know Julio is going to be joining us shortly. Eventually. Usually does. So um, one of the things that I've been starting to have every guest answer is two questions. Um, the question number one is, what is the worst job you have ever had? I worked in the court system, she says. <laughs> <laughs> I know I'm messing. I've actually, this is going to sound terrible. I actually really liked all my jobs. But my very first job, um, I was uh, the counsel they called it concourse at uh, South Oak Lane's bowling alley. And so like when a pin would get stuck, like in a gutter, I'd have to, I was like 15 and I'd have to run down and like push it out. And you're doing that in front of a bunch of old dudes, which is a little bit creepy. And sure. then of course you have to spray all the shoes with the Lysol. Mm -hmm. So that was, but I loved it. I, I loved working there, but yes, what that was probably the grossest thing. Other than that, it was always bartending. Bouquet. Yeah. Yeah. What a fantastic bouquet right? that you must right. have dealt with. It was right. yeah, Lysa oh and uh, and foot odor. It was awesome. <laughs> I can't imagine. There's somebody out there's somebody out there that's gonna yeah, they're gonna put this on repeat and put it on their uh oh well I'm not gonna say that. <laughs> I'm done. Um question number two is uh, extremely on the opposite side of um uh, it's actually serious. We're kind of compiling the answers to put a montage together so question number two is what does the word equality mean to you oh man can't give that um, to the fucking judge no kidding Jeez. Jesus um, Christ. It, it, it's it's so it, it's very uh, it's, that's, <laughs> that's a, it's a hard question to answer and let me tell you why because i don't i mean i don't ever look at anybody 
any differently. Um, so it's hard for me because whether as a human being, as in my job or anything like that, you, you come in front of me, it, it's your actions in front of me that make me determine, you know, how, what I think of you this way or the other. So for me that it's kind of a, it, it's a very difficult question because I just think of everybody as the same, um, before I meet them, when I meet them, I cast no prejudgment on them. And then I determine, exactly, exactly. But I mean, that, you know, that goes with everything. I mean, whether it's race or whether it's gender or whatever it is, you know, you come in front of me, it, it has nothing to do with, um, what you were born with or how you were born. It has to do with the person that you project yourself to be. Um, so that's, so, so I, and I know that's easy for me to say as a person who, you know, grew up, you know, with a family that's parents that are still together after 40, how old am I? So after 45 years, still together, happy, great, you know, good family, great upbringing, very middle-class, hardworking immigrants that came over and worked their butts off. So it's, it's easy for me to say that because I didn't grow up with a lot of, um, uh, I guess, issues that, that some people do, but, but it doesn't change the way I look at people. So that was a really terrible roundabout way of answering mm. your question, but it is, everybody's kind of a, a blank slate to me when I, when I meet them. And then, you know, usually sure. I, it, it depends on how, who, how you act and, and, and the way that you are, that makes me um, treat somebody differently than, than anybody else. So let's, let's dive in that a little bit. And sure. um, we always, uh, starting from the beginning, you did kind of work in the legal system as you're going to, or just before college or going to college, right? Correct. For law? Um, I graduated college early. So before law school started in September, I worked in the mommy prosecutor's office as just right. kind of a legal secretary um, slash intern type of a thing. So, yeah. So from there, you, what was your degree before you went into law school? American studies, uh, which was uh, great because I was, it was history, English, philosophy, and political science. So, and it was all American focused. So I only did American literature classes, American history classes. Um, it was nice because instead of taking like 36 hours of one subject, one, one particular field, I got nine hours of four different things. So I wasn't overly bored. I knew I was gonna go to law school. Um, and it really doesn't matter. I mean, you could, you could act in, or you could major in drama and go to law school. Right. So it does not matter what you what you major in. So that for me was awesome because I didn't get bored. I wasn't, you know, it, it taught me how to critically think pretty well. And I have a fond appreciation of the constitution and of, uh, of, of the country we live in. So so it was perfect for me. Awesome. Good. And and you knew that going into college that you were, uh, were eventually going to go to law school? I, when I was in seventh grade, they ask you, I think we took a tour of UT and they asked you, you know, well, what do you want to be when you grow up so that we can decide who to match you up with to like shadow. And I wanted to be a, a dancer, a uh, ballerina. I was a trained piano player and, and dancer for, for many years. That's what I wanted to do. My dad was like, you can't do that. And I was like, okay, I guess I'll be a lawyer. Well, here we are. <laughs> See, folks, it's just that 30 easy. years later, it's that easy. <laughs> you just you just listen to your father when you say, you know what, I want to be a musician. Like, no, you don't. You want to be a brain surgeon. Well, God damn it, if I'm not That's the worst. That's my brain... father, the musician, yeah. right? Yeah. And your dad's a musician, right? He is. Yeah. It's weird how stuff yeah. ping pongs Isn't back that and crazy? forth. Well, they You're want really... better for you. You know, they want better for their kids. They, they do. They have for themselves. So, yeah. Don't suffer like I did. Well, maybe. Yeah. Just enjoy it as much, yeah. but you, you did, you do music too, right? I do uh, everything. I am Whoa. very lucky to be able to do oh, know, I love it. full control of my life and enjoy it. And I, and I love it. It's awesome. Yeah. All right. Great. So we're going to put a pin yeah. in music as they say in the cliche world, pin a pin in it, Andy, pin a pin in it all the way in, put a um, panic in it. So what if for people that, you know, hear cliche things about going to law school, what would you say was like some of the biggest challenges in trying to get that degree? Um, you there, I mean, there, just like I think with anything there, there are certain subjects that you really, really like. And, and then the ones that you have to take because you have to take them to graduate. Um, it was really hard for me for those ones that I didn't like. Cause it's a lot. I mean, it, law school is a totally different world. 
And I, um, I was the type of student that showed up to class, took great notes, paid attention. I wasn't the best studier. Like I, I didn't go for 10 hours on a Saturday and sit in the library and study because I went to class, because I paid attention, you know, exams would come up and I would just kind of review what I was doing. Um, the egos, I would say is the hardest part about law school oh. because you are all competing against each other. They do it on a curve, which, um, I think, I don't know if they still do, but they did it on a curve. So, um, it, a curve doesn't mean what you want it to mean instead of it being like, Oh, everybody's bumped up. It's a bell curve. So X amount of people are going to get A's X amount of people are going to get a minuses and B wow. pluses and B's. So you could have the third highest score and by 1% and get a B plus. So wow. it was hard. It was, it was, it was super competitive and, um, the, but I can't stand people with, with egos and, you know, the people who want to me, me, ask me, ask me like I, that just drives me insane. Um, but you know, showing up for class, taking good notes, that was kind of, that was kind of my, my game. And I obviously did just fine. Who was the person that you wanted to kick a punch in the face or we kick have, into the groin? We, well, we, kick we in the groin could be. We have, a, we have a year, uh, a couple of my friends and I made like a yearbook and I still, to this day, I don't know half their names, but I remember the names that we called them. We had names for everybody. You don't have to say that. You know, what was there was the always, there was always the person that would throw out some bogus statistic or, or somebody who literally, you know, you, you're looking at the clock and you've got one minute left and they, they go into the question that holds the class, you mm -hmm. know, over like that kind of thing. 20 friggin' minutes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So, I got one yeah, of those. Exactly. And then, you know what? It still holds true right now. You know, we have to go to um, continuing education. I have to do 40 hours every two years, which uh, is actually wow. a lot. And it is. we go to these things and then you get the people that want to jump up and ask the questions that you're kind of like, do you, do you really not know that? Or do you just want to hear yourself talk? Like, I don't, what, why are we, what, why? Happy are we? hour ends in 30 minutes. Yeah. Would you fucking move your ass? Okay. Everybody I, wants to exactly, go drink. Exactly. Um, I am known as the cleaner. I could clean that shit up for you. There you go. No, 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 no. We don't, we don't admit that. She's a judge. <laughs> so it's with the law. Oh, I was talking, I'm working on arcade games. Oh, okay, I don't know okay. what you're thinking about. I, <laughs> So in law school, did anybody wear like cardigans or V-neck sweaters or carry of pipes? Of course. No pipe. <laughs> Not that I remember seeing any pipes. But there you know, are the cigar or the cool cigar smokers. But yeah, I mean, you had the people that dressed up. I would stroll in in my, you know, my, <laughs> my yoga model. pants and my sweatshirt with my hair in a ponytail and be like, dude, I'm here to, I'm, I'm here to get this. Let's go, man. Let's go. So did so, anybody so come to class with a monocle? <laughs> <laughs> interesting question. Oh, this is a very interesting subject. I'm a very big wish... fan of Colonel Mustard, so you know, you know. Martin uh, Mull. Absolutely, right. best movie ever, by the way. Top I five. got, I got more, <laughs> I got more great questions that everyone wants to know. Oh, when you graduated, oh. well, hold on, when you graduated and got your law degree mm -hmm. and passed your bar, who did you get to say you can suck it to? You know, there had to have been somebody that you just like suck it to you. Maybe, you know, wasn't a supporter or an or a nemesis that you know what doubter, I mean? Was it, a doubter. Yeah, anybody that you could who say, was your Draco Malfoy? Oh my gosh. That's a that's a hard question. I was there anybody? Maybe I, there wasn't. You know, you know, here's the deal. I, I think that I think that generally there's always gonna be people that want you to fail. And usually it's women of other women, you know, this whole yeah. women Candy. supporting other women. And I'm like, women are the worst critics of women and the least supportive of women most of the time. It's awful. So, I mean, yeah, there were some people in class that I think were probably like, well, how did she pass? And I'm sitting there thinking, I graduated seventh in our class. What are you talking about? Like, come on, right. I'm not dumb. You know, I'm not a dumb girl. So um, I, I, I'm guessing that there were several people like that that just, you know, they look at you as like, like I said, you're the bartender. You're not the one that's, uh, I, I remember not having, usually you get like an internship in between your first and second year and your second and third year and get yourself all set up for the firm life. I was not doing that. I want, I was, I was younger. I graduated early. I graduated law school early. So I was 24 and a licensed attorney. That's pretty young. Right. And I wanted to enjoy my summers. I was out hanging out and partying with rock bands and, and enjoying life and, and bartending and making a ton of money because and doing well in school. So for me, um, uh, 
there are always those people that didn't expect you to succeed because they yeah. saw the way that you were versus the way they were. And um, I'm guessing there were a plethora of them. I mean, I of course God. I have haters. I I had to run for office. Of course I have haters. Give me a break. Yeah. I mean, that was the I worst gotta, I got to back up on this, like, uh, um, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, like, <laughs> a very educated person, but seen as being... Look at Zach. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. I forgot Zach's libertarian. You don't listen to that stuff, do you? I'm going to take no, a uh, second. Zach Ward, that is. So, okay, first of is all. Is there a code I, word now? Mix me up with. All right, hold on. Uh, what I'm was gonna, your question? <laughs> no, I, no, I want to address this before we move on, Andy, because he put me in the spotlight. It's not even a show about me. Thanks. <laughs> now, I love her because the ability for ideas to be talked and discussed about in this country shouldn't be frowned upon. I don't care how wacky that someone may think or how amazing and you know revolutionary they are. Everybody should take ideas and work things out with debate and what discord right you don't have to agree with everything that they say exactly. but you have to, you you have to respect, like that we respect the hard work and john so, lennon was yeah. an asshole i still yeah. like his music yeah yeah yep. so um moving back to the no that's that's a good point though and i'm glad you threw me under the bus a little bit on that so mm. <laughs> wait, while you're down there can you change the oil because i'm <laughs> driving all over you right now oh <laughs> why is the oil dirty uh, hey, why is the oil dirty? Okay, so um, you graduate law school. You weren't um, conditioned to be in a firm. Uh -uh. Um, so you basically became self-employed. Were you prepared for that? So I got a call uh, in beach right before my last semester of law school. So it would have been the I, I graduated law school early as well. So it was the summer before my third year, my last semester. Uh, from the dean of our college. And she said, you know, I know that you aren't doing the firm thing. She goes, there's an, a local attorney in town who's a criminal defense attorney, and he's looking for somebody to do some research and legal and write, legal research and writing and so on and so forth. I said, okay, who is it? And they said, Alan Connor. And I almost dropped the phone because anybody who knows anything about the legal community in Toledo knows that he would be like the F. Lee Bailey of Toledo. He's the grandfather of all. He is the best that there is. He's the most kind, uh, generous- it's Man. not a boo Ben Kanana. It's his dad. Oh. <laughs> it's his. It's his father. Great job, <laughs> Andy. How's that bus you're under? There you go. Yeah. So, All I can hear is boo. It's amazing. Hey, made national, national, right? Actually, international, from that, international news point, from right. that. Yeah. But um, so Alan kind of took me under his wing, and um, so I was able to do stuff. He would be like, "Give me a project," and then I would, you know, I, okay, I'll have it to you in a day or a week or whatever. And then that got me working on murder cases with them and doing a lot more stuff. And then, like I said, I graduated law school. I was 24, passed the bar. And then within uh, May to October, I had my first murder trial. And Damn. it's very, that's rare as it is, let alone to have it that young, fresh out of law school. And when I say I had my first murder trial, I mean, you know, it actually it's on, that's on national television as well. Uh, it, it, it was an episode. It, it's been on Snapped before, and you know, uh, investigation, discovery, and that's what we're talking that, about. No, that one was when oh. I was twenty-eight. That would be the oh. father. Well, Doctor Seuss yes, looked that horrible is, in that. That is Alan. That is Alan. That, is and Alan. that was the biggest trial in the world. And so, when I say the world, I mean the Vatican was, and I mean yeah. the international news was coming and reporting on it. So awesome. Yeah. yeah. So we're, hey, we'll get to that just for one second because I yep. it just dawned on me. So you're you're fresh out of college, mm -hmm. and you're you're diving into self employment with mm -hmm. you know in Knopf's, um office. So mm -hmm. how do you even start charging people? How do you even come up with a <laughs> method of charging somebody to do something? So I I say all the time, man. I definitely never charged enough, but I I <laughs> I was very honest. I was like, this is how much time I'm putting into this versus you know. Um, what I did was I worked, I started working part-time for the public defender's office. So I got paid a very menial salary. It's like $17,000 a year, no insurance. And that gave me a base of like, it was something like $350 a week. So I had something coming in and then I sat for court appointments. Um, I, and then just word of mouth, you know, I mean, you bartend and you start, you know, a lot of people and something gets like a really over, good racket. And, it you really know, does. There you go. 
no, but then it just, that goes and that goes. And then Alan just introduced me to everybody. And then that, that gets you more notoriety. And then you prove yourself over and over again to the judges that you actually know what you're doing and do a good job. So they appoint you more cases and better cases and bigger cases. And then it does, it's literally just word of mouth. I mean, there'd be some months that the only money that was coming in was the $350 a week. And then some months where, you know, you'd bring in a $10,000 retainer fee on something. So right. yeah. Yeah. Was that's that hard really, to manage? It's really cool. Yeah, it was cool. And it was a total freedom. I mean, there were some days I was done by like nine o'clock, you know, and, and, and then other days that I was at work until six 30. So, yeah. But the, but the idea that and word of mouth seems to be the most potent thing. Absolutely. Seriously. You can show me a million ads for something and I'm not going to care until somebody says, do you know this person and how good they do their yeah. job? Yeah. And I think the biggest thing for me was always, I really, it, it's a double edged sword, but I cared tremendously about people and, and about their doing better. I've carried that over into um, what I do now. And I think that I got, I mean, it was an, it was emotional. I mean, you know, you, you lose a, a trial or, you know, that you, you probably shouldn't have won anyway, but still, you have a connection to somebody, whether they murdered somebody, whether they, it was a bad robbery, whether there were victims or not, you have that, you get this connection with these people and, and you're like, he's still a 21 year old kid. That's going to still a person going to go spend the rest of his life yeah. in prison that Correct. never had a chance. And right. I, not that I needed to get him off or anything like that, but um, they're still, they're still a person. I mean, I got one guy right now who it was a bad case. It was a bad murder. And you know, uh, he always indicated that he was not guilty of the crime. And he was, this happened when he was 21. He's still in jail. Um, and I get a birthday card from him every single year. And yeah. it's not only a birthday card, but it's like a happy 44th birthday, happy 43rd birthday. Like he, may you know, I ask a question? Of course. Um, okay. So <clears throat> yeah, I'm, I'm in mental health right now. Uh -huh. I am uh, going to be a counselor someday. And we have massive amounts of HIPAA, uh -huh. which I'm sure you know all about. Oh, yeah. <laughs> now, what is the difference? Because I'm uneducated in this. What is the difference when it comes to being a law person and when it comes to being a mental health person? Well, what, I mean, there what are... can you say and what can you not say? Because, like, well, I'll tell you what, your shirt looks very un HIPAA. I'll tell you that. Just. Take that. I feel good about myself. Don't shame me. Nice hat. Um, Jerk. There are, uh, obviously Damn. there are some things that are public record. You know, I mean, police reports. Are, I mean, you're going to a good copy of police report. So the general rule of thumb is everything is confidential unless somebody relays to you that they are, uh, you know, about to go commit a crime. I'm going to go kill my wife right now. Danger right. to yourself. You up. can divulge that if it's, but, but if they say I just killed my wife, you cannot divulge that. So it, it is definitely a, this pro feature, tip, everybody. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but wrong by Jimmy that, Hendrix. that would be the general rule of thumb. Hey, I mean, but, but, in all, you know, He's you just guilty. Guilty. green. What you got? No, that song by Jimi Hendrix. Hey, Joe, when he confesses mm -hmm. that he just shot his wife, whoever he well, told not his, his wife, his old lady, his old lady. Oh, oh, lady. Well, yeah, yeah. Nicole, see, see here we are. We're going to devolve, we're gonna devolve into music. <laughs> it's going yeah. to music. So, just you know, jumping kind of going back, and we've we've had the luxury of having. Um, podcast guests that came out in the army. Um, that we've had um a, we have a regular lady comes on once a year for uh dominatrix and we have all these different people that we've had on before and the reason we why i'm premising this, we had a flat earther yeah we had a flat earth really? guy uh, yeah i'm oh, sorry yeah. i'm gonna apologize forever and did by the way the flat earth he's number two but the dominatrix still is higher views than all of that uh a um, financial kick you in the balls yeah, yeah financial dominatrix um Findom, as I say. So the reason why I'm bringing this up and eclectically and talking about equality is, you know, you're you're 20 some years old, you know, and you're doing this thing by yourself. What type? Of, how do you deal with men that 
are assholes. I mean, there, you had to have come across. There's at you, least three in this Zach, room right Zach, now. Zach, you've known me for a really, really long time. I know. It I'm, takes a lot to offend me. Now, that doesn't mean that what um, – it doesn't mean that that what they say is is right or how they act. I mean, are you kidding me? I would I would wear pencil skirts and fishnet tights and high heels yeah. and my little suit coat and walk through the jail. And of course, they all flock to the window. And you know, yeah, yeah, of course. Um, I I have never looked at myself as anything other than somebody who. Uh, I, I don't sit there and I say, well, I don't have the same opportunity as this person or I don't, I, or, or if I was a man, I would have gotten that job. Right. I am just all about, this is who I am. This is how, how I work hard. This is how I get to where I am. Everything I have worked for everything in my life. I've never been handed anything, you know, and, and I, I've lost a, I think the, the funny thing is, I think I've only applied for one job in my life. Uh, everything else I've been self-employed, like I said, I mean, one real job and yeah, I lost it to a guy. Um, but did I go and I, did I say I didn't get that job because it was just because he was a guy? No, you know, it, for whatever reason they hired him over me. Um, that's why it's so hard for me to wrap my head around things. And I'm not saying it doesn't exist. I'm just saying right. for me, it's, it's hard to understand because I know how I treat people and I know how I react to things myself. And I just am such a firm believer in personal responsibility, which this day and age, I, I think that we lose sight of. And I think we, we always want to look on who we're going to blame on why we are where we are. And I'm just, I, I believe very firmly that I used to say this all the time. You know, I went to Bowser high school. I'm a public school girl, hundred mm -hmm. percent. You could have picked me up. You could have put me in Notre Dame at St. Ursula at central. I would have excelled at every single one of those schools, just like in college. You know, I went to a very small private school on a, on a scholarship because I worked hard to get my scholarship. And every year I went there, they gave me more because I proved myself to them more. So my whole philosophy in my life is show me, you know, show, show me that, that you want to work, show me that you want to do better and I will be your biggest fan. That's, that is the whole policy that I have in my courtroom right now. Um, and I know you want to delve into that later, but, um, I tell people well, all the time. You, Corey, because the time goes really fast. Yeah, no kidding. I have two rules. It's don't lie to me and mm -hmm. show up. Those are my only two rules. You could have a 57-page record. You could have a one-page record. I'm going to treat you the same. If you come to me and you tell me you want to help, I'm going to get you the help. But if you blow me off or if you lie to me, you're right. done. You're going to go to do your every day in jail. And when you write me a letter in two weeks and tell me how sorry you are and you really want the help again... I'm not even going to look at it. I'm done. That's that's that's, that's my whole judge -like. personal responsibility. That is judge -like. personal responsibility. That's my thing. And okay, you know that's so, admirable. Yeah. That's admirable to the highest degree, Nicole. Well, it seriously and, and is. You get you get people who really care. I had a guy the other day, and, and believe it or not, I, yes, I have been brought to tears before. Um, I I was in court the other day, and this guy is sober after three years. He was a bad dude. A bad dude. And he came in front of me and he said, you know, I'm doing this, I'm doing that, blah, blah, blah. And I saw all the proof and this has been going on and going on. And I got real teary eyed and I looked at him. I said, you were, you were a bad guy. You were really, really, you did some really bad things. And like he, now he's, you know, in khakis and a nice little white shirt. And he's, I got to get to work and this is what's going on. And a glowing letter, never somebody I would have thought succeeded, never. And there he is, you know, um, I had somebody the other day look at me and tell me, you know what, Judge Corey, you're special. You're special because you actually, I actually feel like you care. And my whole goal is um, the stigma that the system is out to get you. I, I disagree with that wholeheartedly. Now that we're all individual judges, you know, so, so we don't work as one body. We all have different philosophies in our courtroom. For me, if I can make you understand that the system isn't just out to get you and you have somebody who's willing to help you, if you put in the work, mm -hmm. then if I make you better, then the community will be better. And right. that's where I come from. So, you know, you, I bet you at all four of us went and got our license when we were 16 years old, went to the driver's ed, had, did the car insurance, whatever, right? Mm -hmm. We don't owe $4,000 to the BMV because 
you couldn't afford to get your license. So you got pulled over for driving without a license, right. which then you didn't have insurance. And then that turned into this and that turned. I mean, I see people with three pages of license suspensions and they look at me hopeless and they don't care. And then just having somebody say, we're going to do step one, then step two, then step three, and we're going to do baby steps. And I have a little board. It's like, you, it is, it's like you're in kindergarten. I got a little poster board. And when you get your license, you go and you put a little sticker on the board right. and you would not believe the six foot five tall guys that are, you know, that in their picture, they're smiling and judge Corey, can I go put a sticker on the board? And the whole courtroom like claps for him. It's like this nice, good feeling thing. Right. And you think to yourself, we take advantage every day. The idea that we drive, right? This means everything to them. Now they right. can get go to work. Now they can pick up their mom who's sick. Now they can run their kids to school. That little thing changes somebody's life in a way you wouldn't believe. And so it's like, I, I but, but again, don't lie to me. Right. And, you know, and most of the people who lie to me are white female heroin addicts. Okay. Well, that narrows they think it down. That, they, they think they're going to pull the wool over my eyes. And I'm like, I already know what's going to happen. And I mean, when I say we hand walk them to treatment, we have somebody getting them from the jail, taking them to treatment. And nine times out of 10, they walk in the door and they walk out the door. Right. And then within two weeks, I've got the sheriff's finder. They go get her and they go back to jail for every single day that I had just given them a chance to get out of. And then I get a letter within two weeks. And every single time it's the same thing. Nope. No, you yeah. lied to me. <laughs> well, let me ask you this. Um, I have a video clip here and <clears throat> I, this video, I, I'm curious. We've actually had this clip on the show before, so I'm, I'm not going to play. Oh no, don't oh, do no. that one. What? Oh, Jesus. Yo, would you guys uh -oh. stop it? <laughs> stop <laughs> it. Andy. Oh, listen, no. listen, motherfucker. <laughs> you guys are supposed to be my best friends. Stop. Listen, motherfucker. No. Um, not not that. No, 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 no. Oh. What would you do? Now, I'm not going to play the whole video, but how now you have a sticker system. What if somebody is trying to get around the sticker system? Would this method work? Here we go. And also, I wrote a song. Hello there. Jesus Christ. I want to say I'm sorry. For the things I've done And I try and be stronger <laughs> In this life I chose But I want you to know That door I close In your honor I'm sorry, 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 sorry To my mother I'm sorry, sorry Anyway oh, I've, actually, I've actually seen that before and I'm sure I actually, you did have had somebody sing to me before and he uh, is talking about mental health issues. He's actually, he's another dad. He's a bad dude, but he has this kindred spirit with me to where like, I can't, he's just one of those people. There's nothing I can do to help. And unfortunately I hate to say this, but you know, people, people don't, it, it's so difficult to understand the, the mental health system with the court system, when, especially when you're dealing with misdemeanors, which is what I deal with. I, I don't have the ability to put somebody in the psychiatric hospital for long periods of time. I'm like capped out at 30 days. And that's if they come back, not competent, if they committed a misdemeanor of the first degree, I don't have the ability. And so everybody, and it's a terrible vicious cycle. I say all the time, if I were ever an independent billionaire, I would build a respite facility for these people that shouldn't be sitting in jail, but need like a lockdown mental health, but that isn't necessarily jail so that we can get them, regulated and med like basically you have two choices you go to door Medicated. number one or door number actually, two yeah but, actually what bill gates should be doing but but the minute that they walk out the door they just stop taking their meds again and then they're back from the other crime so it gentlemen that, a, gentlemen that sang a song to me it has those exact problems except unfortunately he's extremely violent i'm um, sorry for yeah. showing you that video oh, he, it's he, uh, they, they need an inpatient <laughs> facility yep. that is able to give them the 24 7 stuff the support that they need beyond 30 days we're they talking need, at least need, 90 at least 90 days 120 days they need northwest psychiatric hospital that is a place that we can sentence people to instead of just restoring them to competency we need a place like just like a just like ctf which is our drug facility where we can sentence somebody to 60 days there if we could sentence somebody to you know whatever 30 days there and then we do a review 
that's what we need. And we just, it, that's, that's what makes the system broken. I, I say this all the time, you know, you know it's, I, it's, I don't want to throw out a bogus statistic, but sure. I would honestly say at least, at least 90% of every crime that comes in front of me is either drug related or mental health related. And I don't believe that there's a large percentage of people in the world that are just bad people. I think that they have serious mental health issues or drug issues. And that's what makes them commit stupid crimes. I mean, you got to remember I'm, I'm, we're like the people's court, right? Right. You know, it's the it's the shoplifting, it's the DUIs, it's to, it is domestic violences and it's assaults and it's the bar fights and it's disorderly conduct. It's it's peeing outside. That's the stuff that we get. So it really, really is the people's court. But it's still, I mean, you're not going to do those things if you aren't on heroin. You're not going to do those things if you don't have schizophrenia. You're not going to do the. It, it, it's it's sad. It's sad. so. What? What? How? I'm sorry, Zach Ward, go ahead. But please know that I would like to go. No, go ahead. Go ahead. Go, baby. Um, Nicole, what do you think about crisis intervention teams? Um, I, I think it's wonderful, but I don't think that I, I think. Situation. What, what, what I would like to see happen, and I know that there was talk about this because, you know, there's a big talk about building the new jail, which we desperately need. There's zero question about it. It's but where what it goes I would like, it's pissing people off. What I would yeah. like to see is instead of just, okay, disorderly conduct guy uh, that's come into court literally every week for the same thing, instead of just taking him to jail and then we set a bond and then they referred for competency, blah, blah. Instead of taking him there, it's it, it's door number one or door number two. It's either, uh, they do this a lot with um, overdose cases where sometimes literally if you overdose, they'll say, it's kind of like three shots at the apple. Like you don't get charged with that felony um, it'll always say in the complaint, this is the fourth overdose, or this is the third overdose, the third time this person's been Narcan, mm. then the charges are being filed. Mm. Be could you imagine if they had to file a charge on every single time? I mean, it's, it's, you, you don't, you don't have any idea like how much this is going on, but I would love to see a door number one and a door number two, like, okay, the people that really, really need to go to the jail, go here. The people that need the drug and alcohol intervention or need the mental health intervention, maybe go here. So before mm -hmm. they get arraigned or before like there's right. that, that period of time where maybe the police can say, are you what willing to go to treatment? Are you willing to go here? Are you willing yeah. to go there? And if you are, then we'll see how it goes. And you know, it's a big, big picture that would take a long time. But, it, sure. but so in answer to your question, yes, I think that that would be wonderful, but we'd have to get a lot of agencies and probably a lot of funding in order to make that a reality. So I think yeah. that would be a wonderful. All yes. right. So my, my question before we jump into the trial that rocked the world uh, <laughs> okay. for a couple of minutes, um, yeah. I mean, you're married. Do you have a handsome husband? I have a very handsome husband. Uh, you're Good in love with him. The whole thing. But aside from that, what happens if you find that you like a very attractive guy walks into the courtroom? Why do you got to do this? Why how, the fuck do you well, always do this? Because do you, know you do this when you're playing shows? <laughs> yeah, I'm no. to be Scotty Hayes. I know there that. Are, but there are none more handsome than Scott Hayes. There though. you I'm go. Like, Good for him. For you, I never would have met him. Okay, so <gasps> second. That's how we got you to come oh, out of the show. Holy crap. Second me. best. No other way. Second oh! best attractive man you've ever seen in your life. Uh-huh. Uh, walks in the courtroom. <laughs> do you like, woo? I mean, what did he do? <laughs> I mean, how does it, does it change your, well, I, have I don't know what's broken, but I'm sure you can fix it. So my law clerk is, um, is a female and she sits mm. next to me. And if there's ever a good looking guy, I kind of give her a look and I'll be like, what about him? Is he might be single? You know what I mean? Something <laughs> stupid like that, but no, does it make any difference? No. It's it a misdemeanor. It's okay. That's all right. It's just a misdemeanor. <laughs> okay. It's a traffic well, case. It's fine. You know? it's good. good looking yeah. dude. May, may have a gun. May have two. Yeah, nah, you could, know. So you could, you could probably qualify or disqualify a lot of men in, in the Toledo area just because you they may have been in front of you. <laughs> I every no. without fail without so fail without fail every time I have a show or so yesterday I was mm. at uh, a charity event and somebody walked up to me and goes do you remember representing me in Sylvania I'm like no so I'm like, I'm, I'm concerned every about that day, all the Wasn't time that Mondays do you remember me you from get people the people that know you and then they walk up to you and like so do you remember I doing this with me? requests on Facebook from 
defendants who are pending in my court. And I'm like, here's the, of course there's I the hippie stuff. Them and yes. I block so them because they want to tell that? me stuff. So I have to disclose, like I'll print something off. I'll give it to the public defender. I'll give it to their attorney and the prosecutor and say, I blocked this person. This is what they said. Just so that you know. Like they want this to talk person to created more paperwork for me because they friend requested mm. my ass. This is awful. <laughs> All right. So let's just dive into this case just a little bit. Okay. Uh -huh. This is a big one. I, I remember you going through this. I remember you coming up to the distillery after the case was over. Or you heard the, the verdict distillery. and we all kind of, you, you, I was made, a wreck. yeah, it, I was, it was, a wreck. it was emotional and we we're all, we're having consuming things. Um, in the Zero doubt. <laughs> legally judges are allowed to legally in the in the bar well mm -hmm. she wasn't a judge at that point but um how did you come now could you explain like basically the priest was found guilty sentenced to 15 years to life which that's kind of even like a small thing 15 years alive and why is there such a broad gap in that because they're already 75 years old they're gonna die well, in 15 years then, anyway you have to remember it, it it was a case from 1981 that it allegedly occurred yeah. um um there's a broad range but i i don't know i mean how did you get how did you get on the on the case I mean, that was so, in the room. so so alan and um john thebes and i were all in the same office building we were all right. independent but john thebes was uh he was his priest and so John, as soon as, oh, okay. as soon as he found out, went right to the jail and said, you know, I'll help you out father. And John went to Allen and where Allen goes, I go. And right. uh, Jack Callahan, God rest his soul is the older gentleman who was behind me in that picture. He was actually, as a matter of fact, I think that he is the only attorney in from our area who argued a case in front of the United States Supreme court. I'm not sure I might totally awesome. be lying about that, yeah. but I know it was a United States Supreme court. He was a wonderful, wonderful guy. Good. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, it was it, it it was it was a case of a lifetime for a million a million reasons. But very rare do you have a cold case, first of all, and then yeah. you have a priest who allegedly kills a nun in a chapel on Holy Saturday. I mean, ritual that's sticker. So yeah, and I mean, you can imagine it was it was it was bad i god I the was, more you guys talk about it the more you remember mm, about it uh, well you can, you can catch us on i mean that's another one that was on investigation uh, discovery and forensic files and all these cases a and e all these all these different shows um was it I, at any was it awesome. at any point that you basically said well it's god's plan <laughs> <laughs> And, yeah. and at the very oh, last I, minute, I, after he I, dies I, and he's and he's he's coming out of his body, all he has to do is, oh, I'm sorry, God, and, and God's like, oh, you're cool. It's fine. That's the way it works, right? Full pass. Yeah, that was that one was it was it, I was I was 28, so right. you can imagine being 28 years old having, and what like I said, it was the biggest case in the yeah. world. We had people from all over the world outside of the courthouse, which. Zach, I don't remember if you were set up in in the office at that time, no, but I mean, it was our office was right across the street from the courthouse. So you you know, I was on. We were on Nancy Grace right after Nancy Grace wants to interview you 15 minutes after you get the worst verdict in the world and you're yep. an emotional wreck. I mean, you know, th it was hard. It was hard. Tighten up. Yeah, it was hard. <laughs> uh, I think I held my own, um, but. Um, it's certainly an experience. It made me a better lawyer. That's for sure. Cause some of the issues that we had to deal with were issues that you can't, cause you're dealing with police reports that are, that are 30 years old and everybody's dead. I mean, there's nobody there to testify about things. So I had a huge job because I had to do all the, um, all the legal research it. on all of this old stuff and, and, and rules that you never ever that you learned in evidence and were told you'd never use that you Trial had to fire. use because you had to get all of these old documents in and all this stuff so it was but it did it it shook my world um i i say to this day i will consistently say it i have no idea whether he did it or not i can tell you he consistently maintained he did not um i would not be surprised one way or the other if i found out he did it or didn't do it um but what is God's plan. But <sighs> I don't believe that. that Jesus that, Christ. <laughs> Sorry. Hold on. <laughs> I, Hold on. So my understanding is that he, from what I understand I was is hoping he was that put was on that. this earth to do that 
to actually teach a lesson to other people. So Somebody he actually must fulfilled, like he actually fulfilled what we were supposed to do. And what I was taught, right? Yeah. Um, As a former and Catholic. And at the last minute, all he has to do is say, oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, I, uh, all it's I so easy. Say, it's so easy. All I can say <laughs> is that my opinion was that that was a trial by public opinion. Um, there's no way you can have a trial for a month long and get a verdict in like four hours when when one piece of evidence alone was an a, a two hour long videotape. Um, wow. I, I, and and it, so it hurt my soul because I I, I you want to talk about a hiatus that I took? I was just doing public defender stuff. I was so distraught. I didn't have faith in the system anymore. Yeah. I was like, how beyond a reasonable doubt is a really important thing. And in this case, I just don't know how they got there. And um, yeah, I say all the time, people people ask you what day you want to go back in history and, and see. Yeah. It would be April 5th, 1980 for me. It wouldn't be the resurrection of Jesus Christ. It wouldn't be who shot JFK. It wouldn't be any of that. It would be August 5th, 1980 in the sacristy at Mercy Hospital. I would love to see what happened that day because I have theories. People have theories. Um and I, that's that's the one thing that'll haunt me forever. Is not yeah, it's never going to get solved. Yeah, we'll never know. I'll never know. You'll, okay. ne you'll never, never you'll know. never have your 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 clearance on that. You're oh, oh my god, what an oh. awful. Yeah. It's 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 sad. It makes you like lose a little faith in humanity. Yeah. A like bit. how do you how do you how do you just continue on day by day? There's a reason why that I am a, a a guitar repair man just forgotten <laughs> in a little shop that nobody sees. Because I every day I just like I can't be bothered with humanity because I know how much it sucks. Bro, yeah. Well, how how are you not like just brought uh -oh. down to your Aided? I'm very you know, how, how do you not it's become pregnant. cynical? Pregnant. I just how do you I not am. Become, I just I, I humanity am. sucks. Here's one way. Oh it's easy. <laughs> okay, there you go. So thanks Zach for that setup. That was a perfect segue. Nice segue. So yeah, during the I'm day. Here. Nicole's a judge um, and has to, like we've been talking about, and then also arbitrate on on occasion. On weekends, you get to play with your rock band Arctic Clam. And once again, here's another little picture, really quick. So, where's the name come from? Oh, that, I don't think she's allowed to say that. Okay, uh, we're not on this over show. A mm. Conversation about mm. sushi with Nikki Schaefer, the owner of the Village Idiot. Awesome. Mm -hmm. That's where it came from. Okay, so I can get down. I can get down. <laughs> uh, look at the smile. Look at that smile. It's, it's, that's a truth. That's a true story. Remember Bistro Wasabi at Levis Commons? I yeah. do. They had a dish on the menu called Arctic Clam, and it developed from there. Okay. Cool logo. <laughs> we have a very cool logo. <laughs> Who did actually? Oh, make I've that seen logo? you dozen. I've seen you dozens cousin, and dozens of times. You're all over the place. My cousin drew it on a napkin. And then my dear friend Brett, uh, who was Skid Row's guitar tech, <laughs> drew it even more. And then I think you I digitized you, it. Right? You digitized it and did some color with well, it. But what it, it a was setup there's been a board. Yeah. Yeah, can you believe it? Um, so we're uh, a lot of us and my friends, like all of us here, have careers in some way, oh. shape, or form. And we have many irons in the fire. All of us here play music in this uh, collected group of four. Um, we're so lucky. My, my wife, Jody, says all the time, I don't really have a hobby or hobbies. You know, she's there's people that are envious of, you know, people that have all these different hobbies. Here you are. Here we are. We're playing in bands. We're getting in front of people. And so during the day, you're hopeful to help them help the, uh, the Toledo public area. Uh, move forward progressively and now at night you're also there to continue that joyfulness in life which a lot of people love about music how did you start doing that because i don't think i remember how you i knew it was a duo with greg i think well so even before greg was or uh jazz, jazz Borelli, singer, jonathan borelli um so i it actually started back i was a bartender at the real judd's the original, real, real Jeds behind Brickers Perisburg. and Perrysburg. Yeah. And uh, Greg Aranda and Jonathan Borelli used to play up there on like a random Tuesday night. And then Bobby May played up there. And I was a classically trained piano player. My sister has a ridiculously amazing voice. And she was always known as a singer and I was a piano player. Well, I had a voice too, just nobody really knew it. Um, and I remember going up and singing 
Janis Joplin with them one day, and then I no, kept no, no, singing no, no, it with them, no. kept singing it with them, kept singing it with them, and then there was a um, remember Mona's Riverview Lounge? Oh, uh, I do. Yeah. So my dad, there was an open jam there with Bobby May one night, and my dad was there, and and, and my, uh, Bobby said, you know, hey Nicole, come sing a song. And my dad looked and goes, well, that's not Nina, that's Nicole. And no, I know, let her come sing Bobby McGee. And so I went up and sang with him, and my dad was like, "When did that happen?" I go, "Well, you just never just asked. shut it, Dad. You never sit asked, down, you know." Um, so that all being said, uh, I was I would play some shows with Jonathan Borelli, and then uh, Zach and my friend Greg uh, Dumas and I would play uh, some acoustic stuff. And then Greg moved away, and then the incomparable Mick Mason became my guitar player, and he's. I mean, I know I'm biased, but I think most people would tell you he's probably the best of the best in town. Um, he's just that good. And um, that turned into a full band, which then turned into uh, my husband taking over on the drums in 2012. And then that really, when Scott joined the band, it really changed things. Um, I'm not saying this because he's my husband. He's a really, really great drummer. Um, you know, he's toured all, all over, uh, you know, he's got a real job. Um, and when he came in, it, it really made us be better, which allowed my voice to be better, which allowed mixed guitar playing to be better. And then that's when we just started getting the big shows and things like that. So how many yeah. years would you say? Uh, I would say 20, uh, acoustic forward right um the band has been together for like 12. did you used to play like the attic too like back uh pub st time? george it pub was st. george, st. Yeah, george. Yep. Was. yep 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 that was more with mick i think i might have played a gig or two there with that was maybe 2004 2005 i think yeah yeah and you know the bronze born places like that now now you know since COVID hit i think that you know not only are bar owners learning that um not only are bar owners learning that they don't necessarily uh, need to have you know the full stage set up and, and and bands all the time anymore. I'm actually going back to doing a lot more acoustic stuff. Yeah. Um, but also because I play now with a, it drives me nuts. We kind of have two different versions of Arctic Clam. One is the original version. Um, Mick and Scott, my husband, have been playing together or have been playing in bands for thirty plus years, forty years. Yeah. And they're tired and they don't want to do the bar gigs and all that. Who I don't want to do the bar gigs. Anymore. They're, yeah, they're, there's, they're Buckeye card holders. In the yeah, music. yeah, right. Yeah. There's a couple. They, AARP comes in our mail all the time. Um, I just got my first one the other day. Oh, my God. <laughs> but, then, um, Shit. but then there's another version of the band where we are kind of, we kind of have a rotation of guitar players. Um, and then it's with other two other musicians that are full-time musicians that's all they do mm -hmm. so their schedules are kind of crazy and then we've got us the, the original band that all has you know full-time jobs and trying to do it so it's kind we're really just playing events right now but i prefer that because it's way better money yeah. uh, it, it's less hectic and it's um you always you know pay a sound guy and you know you don't have to drag the equipment in I mean, it's a lot, and now that we're older, it's it is. It's just a lot. You know who who the hell wants to be dragging subwoofers in? And and I had to marry a damn drummer and not a harmonica player. Yeah, so it's really. like I got to carry a drum set in when I go. You know, it's it, so so we're we're really we we hit it hard. July was hard. We were yeah. like old school, like Fridays and Saturdays, but they were event, 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 event. Uh, we have. And then things are starting to slow down a little bit. So that's so. That's what what goes through your head? What does it? What turns you on when oh you know my. the day's over? <laughs> Jesus, he yeah. always comes up with this shit. <laughs> Jesus Christ! Hear me out. So what really gets you going? So when you 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 you, what's nice about playing music is you can turn that switch off and you get to go on stage. Is yep. basically where I'm getting at. Yep. And it is a turn on, Andy. You know, it doesn't have to be that way well yeah it can't be but what is it for you that you you know because you're scrambling through the day you're also scrambling to get sound check ready and everything but the moment everybody starts going you know a lot of people that aren't in bands just don't know but what is that for you you mean you mean uh, while what's I'm your pre-show look like 
playing music or no, early? no, 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 no. Oh. I'm saying all the pre-show stuff's done because yeah, we're, yeah, yeah. we're still stressing to make sure the sound's right and everything. But the moment you start playing, what is it for you from the time the gig starts to the time the gig ends? Um, the crowd, the appreciation. Um, I've noticed it more recently, and I think it's because we didn't have live music for such a long time. Oh, it's but, been a boon. Yeah, but but the, totally crowd, the, the crowd and and them being interested and them, you know, it's always nice to be complimented, but it's not about that. It's more seeing people like enjoying life and and singing other people's. The, the part about this weird to me is they're singing other people's words to me as if they're mine. You know what right. I mean? And I'm for the record, I am extremely happy being a cover band artist. Um, I am. A ridiculous perfectionist and I have thrown every song I've ever written in the garbage and people think I'm crazy for that but I'm such a perfectionist and stuff I don't want to um, publicly release something or play something publicly that I am not like that's a phenomenal song and that's just me I'm happy doing my own spin and you know maybe being the the rock band in Toledo and maybe being the rock band that um, plays songs without the keyboard but it still sounds like there's mm -hmm. a keyboard like you got 12 different parts but you're doing it with a four-piece band like that that's kind of stuff that i like to do my so, last yeah. I, I have one more question yeah um and then we've pretty much believe it or yeah. not reached the end of this i knew this uh -oh. was very be... easy to talk to Zach. it's a nicole sequel we're looking at everybody <laughs> well i'll tell you what i i would like to i usually come to judge we'll again do, we do before acoustics yeah I, that's what i was going to yeah. say i i I, uh, I love that the the acoustics for autism you have oh my god so yeah the, let's uh, we yeah, kind of we yeah we've kind of misfired on we've talked about that and it's been a long time since I wanted to have you on this to begin with and yeah. thank you again for your time um but we'll try to hit the acoustics for autism in March we'll get, or in February we'll get Scotty on too yeah in February and do your way, do your do your internet research on that and get, get yeah. fluent there's, because there's, it's they, a really good cause. It's a fantastic cause. There's a lot of firepower behind this. Yeah, and there's a we we try here in this podcast to cover stuff that people typically don't get. So, like when we had Reeves Gabriel, the guitar player for the Cure, on, we don't ask typical questions. We go down some paths that information you can't typically find. And let's just face it, not a lot of people know judges and and get to have that type of lawyer inside behind the scenes. So that's why I, I was really. I feel like they still don't after this podcast, but. Probably. No, no, no. <laughs> we, can, we can found every exit. I've, I've already been getting emails. It says, go to school, American history, get your law degree, become a judge. It's just that simple. It is um, so easy. <laughs> so uh, my last question, and then Green and Andy, if you have anything before we adjourn, is um, uh, back in the beginning of your musical career, as it relates to performing live with Brelly and all these guys, um, there was a competition of the Bobby McGee that every woman that was a singer in town had <laughs> were on. They were on a collective individual. I can't even believe you're going to go there. Hold on. I came on later. Hold on. on. The fuck I that's fine. Hold on. I didn't even do this. Your Honor, I didn't get to finish my statement. <gasps> <laughs> Just, I have, I, I fit a piece You're going of the to jail, court. asshole. If it pieces the, wait, is this Canada? It's a piece of the court. Piece of the court. Um, if it poutines the court. I've, pre I've been preparing this in my head all day. Um, a, a great number of women were individually on their own broom, so to speak, on the song Bobby McGee around town. Um, can you first deny or confirm that that actually is somewhat true? <laughs> it is, but I wasn't part of that because I, I actually came on a little that. later to the mm. game. But sure. one of them sounded like a billy goat. Did I just say that out loud? I didn't. Ah, know. Ah, 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 ah. And you know what I'm talking about, Zach. <laughs> so, <laughs> so there, there was a whole bunch of them, and I, I'm not going to name uh, names. Yeah, yeah. And, and and at least one of them you're good friends with now. Absolutely. So yeah. one of my best friends what, in the world. Yeah. What was it about the Bobby McGee challenge in, Tol in Toledo specifically <laughs> that <laughs> made so all of these challenge. women? That, that's the cattiest mother. So funny that you say that because I try to stay away from that song so much that I, I do peace of my heart more. And I really want to do there's there's a couple other songs by Janice that I want to do. I just am a little bit, I'm like, man, that's, that's a little bit hard to sing. Um, it's like singing Ann Wilson from Heart. I mean, unless you can do it, you shouldn't try, you know what I mean? 
Um, it's a female Chris but, Cornell. But it is. You're a hundred percent right. I don't know. It's like, don't stop believing. It's like, there's a song you have to play. And for girls, it seems to be Bobby McGee. And, and I don't have it on any set list. The only time I played is if somebody asked me to play it. So yeah, I, don't well, know shit. It, I don't know if it's because it's easy for the musicians to play it. So like, Hey, can I jump up and sing Bobby McGee? It's three chords. You know what I mean? I don't know if that's it. It's it has a key change. I or what? Well, but it's still, you know, I, I, I don't okay. know. Let me, don't let know. me, let know. me re rephrase the question, your honor. What was it about the women trying to have the raspy scream, the best raspy scream out of everyone else in Toledo that made them fly around on broomsticks and hate each other? I guess that's <laughs> we're in that short window of time. Um, I think that things have changed a little bit and I'm not saying this to be altruistic. I'm being honest. You are 1 million percent right. Late nineties, early two thousands. There were yeah. probably two, maybe three to four prominent female singers. Mm -hmm. And there was that competition. And as far as I was concerned, there wasn't competition. There was one oh, that was damn. very good at it. And it wasn't me. I wasn't involved. Then the female singers kind of weren't around. Now, every band thinks that they have to have a female singer, which always drives me a little bit crazy. But the one thing that I do notice now, and I'm not just saying this, I do think that we are so much more supportive of each other now than we ever were Agreed. than 20 years ago. And that is one thing I can say. I, like I say, women are 1 million percent catty because that's just what we are. But our, our female singers now do not behave the way and that you, I think 20 years ago that, that and you are so right that you it see, was like you see a lot yeah. of live bands especially you host an event you know we yeah. have 30 40 50 bands playing in March and you, you you yeah you you got tabs on everybody who is the worst girl singer in town oh my god I this is not a fair that. question <laughs> oh my god you are an ass <laughs> I'm, I'm just kidding I, I even he's beyond not, that question he's not though that's the ass. thing <laughs> You're still an ass. It's not green. Can't uh, give my secrets away. Yeah, I have um, to go to the bathroom. Let mm. me go. Uh, go ahead, Green. Do you have any? Yeah, last you know, question? I hate to bring the room down, but no, oh, I just yeah. was wondering earlier when you said that you're a lover of the Constitution, you're a lover of the country. When you look about the future, do you? Um, what do you think our future lies? You have hope because. Like, I'm not of any type of religion or political party. I'm just here basically under one thing. It's like, don't be a dick. But I'm seeing things right now that I never thought I would ha see happen in my lifetime. So when you look into the future of America, do you have okay. hope or or what? I Great mean, being question. somebody of a, a lover of the country and constitution, where's I, your headset? I... <sighs> Great question, man. I know exactly how uh, what I want to say. I'm trying to figure out how to say it out loud. Um, do I have hope? Not necessarily. I'm fearful. Um, I think that the access to information and social media that we have is a double-edged sword. I think it is a wonderful benefit to wonderful things like uh, charity events and and promoting your band and uh, running a campaign, I think it is uh, a very easy tool to try to destroy uh, each other and human beings yeah. with uh, a click of a button. And that's what's fearful to me. Um, I think that we need to get away from this. You're either right wing or left wing. I think mm -hmm. we need to get away from. I say that to people all the time. I'm like, I'm people. They would ask me all the time, well, "What are you?" I'm Nicole. That's what I am. That's what I am. I went to Hillsdale. I went. I went to Hillsdale College, but I started Toledo Pride. So don't tell me that I fit in a box because I don't. You know, and I just am a good person and I believe in being a good person and I wish that everybody would believe in being a good person and doing the right thing. And you don't have to fit in a box. And there's this brainwashing and mindset that you're either this or this. And the part about it that makes me the most insane is that 90 percent of us are right here. And we might lean a little bit this way or this way on different uh, on different ideas and different and different. Um, I can't even think of what I'm trying to say issues right, right now. But the loudest 5% on this side and the loudest 5% on this side are bringing the country down. And that's what, Bob, that's what worries me. So do I, again, I am not, a, a, 
by nature, I'm not an optimistic person. I'm a pragmatist. I am absolutely cynical because of what I see in a volume every single day. Mm -hmm. So I'm not going to give you the, the, the hopey feely answer because I, I, I have a lot of fear, but that being said, you know, I have family over in Syria right now. We do live in the greatest country in the entire world and ask my dad or ask uh, anybody that came over on the boat and they will tell you that they will tell you that we, you know, that, that there is a reason that we came here and a reason that we are here and that we work here the way that we do. Um, I wish that the generation that is uh, probably the most energetic right now had respect for that. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that we're lacking a lot of that right now. And I hope we can turn it around. I certainly do. But right now, that's why I just keep trying to do what I can do in my own little bubble mm -hmm. to make, make people understand and believe that there's somebody that will have faith in you, but you got to do the work too. Um, yeah. And I might just be one very sm small piece of the puzzle. But if I can help you be better, then you're going to help us all be better. So I know, I, I, I hope I answered your question, no, but it, it, very, it, in and yeah. of very good. Very, Thank you. I, yeah. Very good. good. Um, I, I, I don't feel like I'm losing my mind. Thank you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> oh, wow. That's a big fucking thing with Zach green. Wow. That, this dude's you literally like spilling his brains into a fucking copper cup. <laughs> that's spinning. Mm -hmm. It's spinning. not, he's not drinking it. He's actually <laughs> every time he does that. <laughs> He's All just right. trying to get rid of something. Well, you've been nothing but a pleasure. We really appreciate Amazing. you taking time. Um, we will try to get on the books um, at least two sure. or three weeks or four weeks before Acoustics for Autism next week. And we'll have the links. And if people that don't live in the Ohio area that tune into the show will also be able to, if they want to participate and, and financially contribute, we can do it from there. Other than that... Um, Hey, Nicole, have a great night. Thank you so much. And thank you. Folks, coming out. We thank will... you, guys. And yeah, and thanks. Jack, thank you for introducing me to my husband. Yeah, no problem. And thanks for everybody coming here on a Monday. We do this every Tuesday if this is your first time. Um, we're, we're all hitting uh, the road tomorrow, right? Yeah, we're hitting the road tomorrow. <laughs> I, I have a three-day stink in Putin Bay that uh, I will not be here. Uh, I gotta Andy. fucking do my internship. I'm um, I'm heading out to the country, away from no. everything. In a big country <laughs> with the Zaki Green in the mountainside. You know, if any of you guys ever want to come down to Muni, Muni, just let me know. I mean, with without a court order. <laughs> oh. <laughs> yeah. I've spent enough time in court in my life. I think I don't need to do that ever again. Yeah, uh, uh, I've got a nice one come up September 10th for mm. so much yeah. fun. Um, anyway, folks, have a great weekend and week, and we will see you next week. Father, Son. Thank you.